one of the longest single conflicts in human history, the Dutch Revolt or the Eighty Years' War, was the catalyst for the establishment of the Netherlands and everything that follows then. But how did it begin? The Dutch were under pressure to quickly but decisively innovate to better their own force in order to compete with the Spanish army, the actual military powerhouse of the period. The so-called Tercio, a deep square formation made up of pikemen and shot infantry, frequently supplemented by cavalry and artillery, served as the foundation of Spanish military power at the period. However, how did the Dutch defeat this military titan? The 80-year struggle the Dutch waged against the Habsburg Spanish Empire from 1568 to 1648 led for the first time to an independent Netherlands. Warriors in orange standing up to loudly chatting Spanish men in the red and yellow colored war outfits. It's going to be a lot of fun, so let's begin already. But before we are looking to how the Dutch managed to get their independence, and to what actually happened in the 80 years war, we need to know some background information, to understand the video better. So let's look at the map of Europe related to religion in the 16th century. We see that the Netherlands is mostly Catholic, with a minority of Calvinism, led by Sean Calvin. This was eventually spread throughout France and Switzerland and in the southern provinces of France. In Spain, on the other hand, we see that almost the whole of the country is Catholic. France was at first mainly Catholic, but later Protestantism slowly began to rise in popularity and later Calvinism arose named after its leader, Sean Calvin. As Calvinism grew, religious issues continued. Due to their own Calvinist convictions or because they believed it was the best way to maintain peace, many lords supported religious tolerance. William of Orange, also known as William the Silent, the Moral, the Count of Vague Mont, and Philippe de Montmorency, the Count of Horn, were three of these nobles who stood out. Many lords from all 17 provinces joined together in 1566 to endorse a petition that asked Margaret of Parma, the administrator of the Netherlands, to put an end to the persecution of Calvinists. Both Catholics and Protestants supported this petition because they believed that the persecutions would spark an insurrection and that local lords, not the monarch of Spain, should handle these issues. Margaret consented to putting an end to the persecutions in the interim, until she spoke with King Philippe. This was meant to ensure peace, but instead it encouraged Calvinists to openly practice hedge preaching, or public worship, outside of cities. Many of these hedge preachers, who wandered the countryside trying to convert people and preaching Protestant sermons, condemned the usage of images in the church. This infuriated the Protestants. And as a result tensions increased, and it wasn't long before violence broke out. As idolatry in the South, many people who heard these speeches proceeded to act and started iconoclasm, which is the practice of destroying religious images. Any possibility of a sustainable peace was destroyed as this violence, known as the iconoclastic rage, swept north. Any dissenters the division saw would be put down, according to Margaret. Horn and Egmont supported William. While William opposed them, the Catholic forces, who were bolstered in 1567 by 10,000 men led by Fernando Álvarez de Toledo, found it relatively simple to restore order. The Council of Troubles was created by the incredibly unpleasant Spanish men. He had Horn and Egmont arrested and executed for their prior proposition of religious toleration in order to restore order to those who had rebelled. While in 1568, William was able to escape to the Holy Roman Empire. William began a campaign of armed resistance against the 17 provinces' Spanish masters. William's campaign, which saw few major successes or losses on land, was largely unsuccessful, kicking off the Dutch Revolt in the Eighty Years' War. However, his uprising was considerably more successful at sea. He made extensive use of sea beggars, or privateers, whom he assigned to assault Spanish shipping in the ports along the coast. As William booked improvement and success at sea, he later attempted to invade with a sizable mercenary army but was unsuccessful. William then tried to ally himself with the Huguenots in France but they kept coming under attack from the Catholics and were unable to aid the Dutch, who in 1568 initially invaded again with success. Signifying the official Dutch start of the Eighty Years' War but the Duke of Alba then defeats them once more, setting everything right back where they were. Until finally Spain begins to engage in a conflict with the Ottomans while facing opposition from France and retaliation from England. All because the majority of these nations back Dutch nationals, because of political reasons. This indicates that they are using all of their available manpower to deal with these many dangers. Consequently, this makes their grasp on the elector Husson weaker. In 1572, when they are expelled from England, William returns and opens up shop there in order to visit two cities in Holland swiftly and urge the other cities in the area to rebel as well. In addition many Protestants seem to be convinced by the Dutch lord, 
and many of them join him in his fight. The army is getting bigger and bigger and it seems a matter of time before he is going in the attacking mode again. Alva, who was now in charge of the Netherlands, was more focused on restoring Catholicism and rising taxes, than on Willem. The rising of taxes in 1969 didn't make him popular at all, many were annoyed. Alba later pushed his force south, leaving some of the northern cities utterly undefended, since he was afraid of an invasion. Early in 1572, Elizabeth I expelled sea beggars from English ports, they then took over the ports of Netherlands Brilliant, who they fleeced. As a result, numerous towns in the province of Holland declared their support for the rebels. The significant exception was Amsterdam, which maintained its Catholic Church allegiance to the Spanish throne. The rebels, who were now concentrated in the city of Dordrecht, had support from the province of Zeeland as well. From 1573 onwards there was a lot of fighting at sea and many battles followed on the heroic and film-like warships. The battles on the sea were then mainly fought between the Spaniards and the in Dutch so-called Waternizen. Meanwhile, William of Orange in the year 1575 is still mainly concerned with winning people over, because where Alva mainly works against people with his high taxations, William of Orange is helping and collecting people for the battles. A university in Leiden was built and William shows his gratitude to the leaders, who resisted the siege by the Spaniards. In 1577 an important development occurred in the history of the Eighty Years' War. The pacification of Ghent. This meant that a pact was made whereby the north and south of the Netherlands made peace with each other, which in turn had the consequence that together they could form a much larger army and fight a common battle. The Spanish troops will be recalled and the states themselves will maintain Catholicism. Later, on April 6, the Peace Treaty of the Union Brussels is signed by all the Dutch regions, after negotiations between William of Orange and Archduke Matthias of Austria, who was appointed by the Southern Netherlands as their governor. On July 24, this treaty is broken again after Don Juan attacks the Stan names. After this attack, the regions no longer accept Don Juan as governor and Matthias of Austria becomes the new replacement. In essence, the conquered had collapsed by 1579, and two new unions had emerged. The Union of Utrecht, which wished to put an end to what they perceived as Spanish dictatorship and allow for freedom of conscience, was in the north. In the south, the Union of Harass, which pledged its fealty to the Spanish throne and repudiated Protestantism. The United Provinces, also known as the Union of Utrecht, had Antwerp as its capital and operated as a unified body, pooling resources to build a single army. Willem had also requested assistance from the English, and the little English force responded by sending John Norris to help. Despite his lack of success, Norris did capture Mechelen during the English fury of 1581, which he then soon sacked. The Pacify of Philartiga, also known as the Act of Abjuration, was signed at The Hague and declared the independence by many of the provinces of the Netherlands from the allegiance to Philip II of Spain, during the Dutch Revolt. Which meant it declared the United Provinces free and an independent state. Later William of Orange was proclaimed States General of the Netherlands in the year 1581. The French king's Catholic successor, Francis the Duke of Anjou, was then invited by William to take over as ruler of the Netherlands. Due to his lack of real authority, the majority of the provinces essentially disregarded him, while others, like Antwerp, flatly refused to recognize him. So in 1583, the Duke of Anjou made an underhanded attempt to capture Antwerp, but when his soldiers were killed during the so-called French Fury, he escaped to France, which wasn't ideal for William. In 1580, three years earlier, something happens that changed a lot. William of Orange is banned by Cardinal Granvelle by order of Philip II of Spain and a cash prize is put on his head. But the verdict, stopping at your peak was not reserved for the then so important William of Orange. In fact, he has never been able to reach his peak. The price that was on his head ensured that not only assassins, but even citizens wanted to take a chance to run off with the money. And what happened next was William getting assassinated. He was shot in the head and died tragically. Due to Farnesio's skill as a general by 1584, who later rose to become the Duke of Parma, the conflict had just changed in Spain's favor. He had retaken control of this region. The United Provinces, the capital of Antwerp, was taken by him. The next year, as a result, 100,000 Calvinists fled to the north. Amsterdam remained the first city of the United Provinces and the center of the rebellion against Spain as a result. After William's passing, the United Provinces' leadership experienced some initial difficulties. Elizabeth I's close friend Robert Dudley assumed the office of governor of the Netherlands, thereby declaring war on Spain. 
because the eldest son of William's entry permit was refused by States General and he therefore did not inherit what his father had built, Philip William of Orange had become an enemy of Dudley together with Johann van Oldenbarnevelt. After a string of military setbacks, Dudley's authority was in ruins by 1587. He left the United Provinces and went back to England as a result. The United Provinces were proclaimed a confederation and a republic in 1588 as a result of the difficulties in locating a monarch, which emboldened and legitimized those clamoring for the end of the monarchy. In 1588 the Netherlands was divided into seven different provinces. In the same year, the Spanish Armada was defeated by an English fleet led by Admiral Francis Drake and things were going so badly that they also lose the three consecutive confrontations. By the time of Philippe II's death in 1598, the duchy had reclaimed this region. The Dutch Republic dispatched ships far and wide in search of markets throughout the Indian Ocean in order to develop trade and finance the war, this resulted in the immensely profitable spice trade in 1602. Dutch traders established the VO, the Dutch East India Company, which would have a monopoly on trade as well as the authority to fight war and sign treaties, in order to lessen the danger associated with this trade and to assist boost earnings. In 1610 Philip William of Orange took his place as Lord of Breda after 25 years. He restores the Roman Church, but respects the position of power of the Reformed Church. In 1618 on 20 February Maurits van Nassau inherits the title Prince of Orange on the death of his older half-brother Philip William. This comes in handy in his power struggle with Johann van Oldenbarnevelt. On June 25, the battleship took place between the Netherlands and Spain in the Mediterranean Sea. On 26 or 29 August Johann van Oldenbarnevelt, Hugo Grotius and Hujerbeets were captured. On May 12, 1619, Oldenbarnevelt is convicted of high treason, and he is beheaded on May 13. Later in 1628 the fleet of the West India Company under Pete Hine wins a spectacular victory in the Battle of the Bay of Matanzas off the coast of the island of Cuba. He intercepts the Silver Fleet. This leaves 11 million guilders in the hands of the Republic. This represents about three quarters of a year of war spending. Further on there are many more generals following of the armies, who are trying to take their country to the victory, and the war between the Netherlands and Spain kept on going. In the end no one actually won. They decided to sign a pact of peace in the year 1648, and this was the end of the longest war in history. Eventually the south of the Netherlands belonged to Spain, and the Netherlands had won their independence. Looking back at it, the Eighty Years' War was for great use for the Netherlands, as it got them an independence. It has changed many beliefs about religions and it partly caused the freedom of religion in many countries. So on this day it's still an important topic, and it should be in history class for the upcoming centuries. Anyway, thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next video.